So, welcome everyone uh, to the Zen of Akka talk. Uh, if anyone has seen the talk previously, it was online once, but otherwise um, it's relatively fresh, and I do want to actually repeat it because it's actually an important one, right? So, we're gonna see what it's about in a few seconds. So, who am I? Uh, Conrad Malavsky, work on the Akka team at Lightband. Uh, also did the Reactive Streams TCK, so techno Technology Compatibility Kit, and I'm doing a bunch of um, community and conference work, like, for example, the Geekon conference in Poland, uh, which is going on right now. So after this talk, I actually have to go back, so try to catch me quickly afterwards if you have questions. If you don't catch me afterwards, just tweet me, and I'll be sure to get back to you. So, don't need to introduce Arka to you. So let's jump right in. So my question is, uh, who's actually using Akka? Okay, who's like beginning to use Akka and like not very comfortable yet? Okay, good. So this is basically the right talk for you guys, both who have raised their hands. Uh, so the agenda is uh, pretty much 14 or so, uh, let's call it tips or patterns or anti-patterns sometimes, that I wanna talk about and they're more or less related to each other, but there's going to be a, some topic jumping. So where does the title of the talk come from? Uh, maybe some of you have seen the Tower of Programming book by Jeffrey James. It's a hilarious book that tries to explain programming in the way of Tao, like a Tao master explaining his um, philosophy of programming. There's another one, Zen of Programming, and I thought that that's a nice uh, way to inspire maybe people. So, moving on. So the Akka landscape. So for those of you who didn't raise your hands before, uh, here's what Akka is. So Akka is a toolkit and you basically pick and choose whichever modules you want. Uh, the core of it being pretty much actors, right? So Akka is mostly about actors. Of course, we have other modules, but truth is everything is built on top of or around actors. So I actually didn't have this tip previously when I did this talk, but I figured it's how could I have forgotten the most important thing ever, like, which is messages? So the zeroth option that we want to talk about today is messaging, right? So sometimes people think, oh my God, messaging, this is so weird. But when you think about it, or ask Alan Kay, so person who pretty much coined the term object-oriented programming, it was always the thing about object-oriented programming, to hide state, to isolate the state in your kind of thing that no one else can touch and then co to communicate via messaging. So this is what Akka is pretty much all about, and we'll see how that actually is interesting. Because one actor is no actor. Well, of course you can have one actor and it's um, a bit maybe lonely or sad. And yeah, it can do a bunch of things. So it can reply to messages, it can drop a message if it wants to, right? And it also can schedule messages to itself or uh, spawn child actors, right? That's pretty much the only things an actor can do. So, but at the point in time where you have a second actor already, it becomes more interesting. So let's say we have a yellow specialist Bob, which you don't see as good, but he's a yellow specialist there. And you can delegate the yellow messages to the guy who's really good at handling those. And here's where the interesting pattern starts to emerge, like worker pools, delegating the work to the right places, sharding the messages somewhere. And this all makes sense because messaging is so both easy to explain and understand, and also it exactly matches what computers actually do. I mean, I put some message onto the wire, someone gives me back another message, right? It all maps perfectly. And interesting patterns emerge, like directly replying to the original sender of a message. If, if this would have been our RPC stuff, it would have been the entire chain going back and returning, right? Here we can do smarter stuff and more interesting uh, communication patterns because we're more free to do different things. So, um, if you have one actor, you're not really leveraging anything Akka does to you, uh, helps you to, to build. So have multiple ones. One tip at the bottom here is to avoid actor selection. Anyone know actor selection? Of course you do, right? So the problem is sometimes people figure out that they can find an actor by just their address that they remember or hard code somewhere, etc., etc. 
And this is kind of like going to a random stranger's house because you know where they live and taking their TV, right? So you should be introduced to a person, right? Actors also should be introduced to one another, right? So I should be introduced to, hey, if you want to talk about yellow messages, here's an actor ref that is good to handle yellow messages. And I shouldn't be randomly guessing addresses of people. Which brings us to the second topic, which is structuring your actor systems in general. So sometimes when people start out with ACA, they start uh, lots of actors. OK, good. We have more than one, so it's, it's better. But it's not really structured. It's this mess of pink and blue ones like all between each other. Uh, this is actually how you can envision uh, and visualize uh, what happens when you do lots of system actor off. Right? It's top level actors. Whereas uh, it gets more structured when you use context actor off, right? So I'm in an actor, I'm spawning a child actor, so there is a hierarchy. It, it starts to make sense. So this small actor that I started is helping me to do my job, right? It, and it's structured in a nice, understandable way. So it's as easy as doing context and not system actor off. The implications are the hierarchy and the supervision that you gain from it. And of course, the previous patterns also emerge. So these could be pools and, and other uh, routers, etc. So naming. Naming is hard, and sadly, doubly so in actors. I wouldn't say it's actually that hard. It's just that people are lazy, including myself sometimes. And we revert to using the default thing. So what is the default name of an actor? Uh, so you basically have a sequence number. And for each child that you start, we increment the number. And from that number, we take the uh, basics 4, which gives us names like $A, $B, $C for the first, second, third actor. So why is this bad? Well, let's say one of these actors blows up. What was it doing? What was its purpose in life? I don't know. It's A actor, B actor. So it's not very helpful when uh, things go wrong, right? When you want to trace or debug your system. So instead, what we should be doing most of the time is actually giving them proper names, right? So here, the second parameter after the props is the actor name. And here, I'm using um, an incremental counter, right? I have a multiple uh, actors that are some kind of worker, and I name them fetch worker one, fetch worker two. It's already better when it blows up or I see something weird going on in the logs. I at least know, okay, it's a fetch worker. Can we do better than that? And actually, why isn't this built in? Because people would ask, oh, I want this uh, sequential name generating thingy by default. Well, actually, I think it's not the best thing we can do. And I would prefer to encourage doing the best thing and not the second to best thing. Right? So if you really want sequential names, it's five lines of code like that to have a generator. But this is the thing we should all be doing all the time, which is having an actual useful name. Okay, so let's imagine I have a service that's fetching videos from uh, YouTube, Vimeo, some video services. And I can encode that, okay, uh, fetch YouTube and then ID. What this means is when, when this actor has some trouble or it's logging things, I know which video I'm talking about here. And if it blows up, I get it in the supervision uh, as the sender, right? So this is the parent catching the chart being uh, failed. And then we know which child it was, and we can log a useful error message. Right? So it's all about being useful when things go wrong. So this is the best way to do things. Small side note, usually everybody knows this, but somehow once you start hacking, you forget about it. Right? So obviously we know Scala has the nice um, uh, uh, string interpolation syntax, which is the first line here, so S, and then I do a dollar sign, and I can have a nicely readable error, uh, message there. But of course, we know this costs uh, string concatenations, right? And it always concatenates, even though uh, the debug level maybe is not on, right? We all know that. However, it's as simple as doing the second style to avoid these allocations. And I know everybody is like, oh, yeah, of course I know that. But then I go to the customers, see it in production, and you know, it's actually trashing the system with lots of lots of strings being concatenated. So quick reminder. So this is something uh, that was originally uh, pitched to me and uh, during a talk, actually, by Jamie Allen. And it's the matrix of mutability, also known pain. Uh, and it goes like that, right? And we've actually 
During this conference, I already saw one of the mistakes I'm going to explain here as well. So be wary of it. So we have this um, value and variable right in Scala. Usually we should be using value, nice immutable stuff, and then we have uh, different data structures, like mutable or immutable data structures. So if I put something in an immutable val, well, then it basically never changes, and I'm really happy I can trust that thing. It's like a fact, right? However, most of the time, things change, because maybe I have some list of uh, people I'm communicating with, and I'm changing it. So then I would argue that we should prefer a var with an immutable data structure in it, and not a mutable data structure in a value. Why do I say that? Because maybe I want to tell someone about the people I'm communicating with, right, uh, this list. And if I want to do that, and I have an immutable data structure, and I send it all over somewhere in a message, then everybody is safe. No one can mutate that collection. However, when I accidentally send someone an immutable collection, and they start mutating it under my feet, that's not a good thing. Right? And then we have the last uh, case, um, which I probably should always avoid. I tried to illustrate the pain and uh, panic when I see that. So mutable and var is really scary because, so which, where, which style are we going to mutate it? Both? So the scary thing is this is the default in uh, Java, right? There's uh, mutable collections and you don't have final as the default. You have to actually add the final to the reference field. So uh, one thing where Scala is already a bit better with uh, trying to get you more left and more up on this scale, right? So remember, trusting it in uh, seeing it in code is really simple. You just look if there's a mutable or not. A pro tip, if you're using some kind of editor like IntelliJ or something else, you can easily set up rules to color like mutable collections in bright red with exclamation marks or something. So you know that it's a mutable thing and it needs to be treated with uh, care. So still pretty much basics, but you'd be surprised how sometimes we forget. So next one is about blocking, OK? So quick reminder what blocking is. Blocking is that gray line on this uh, diagram. It basically means that I'm doing some long running operation, maybe file access, maybe, um, maybe some database access in a blocking way. And I'm basically using up my thread, and no one else can do something while I'm waiting there. So blocking in simple terms is just wasting time, because I could be doing something else and be notified once the thing has been completed. So um, real example, someone asking on Stack Overflow, uh, the question is, uh, okay, HTTP blocking in the future blocks the server. And yeah, I'll highlight what I mean here. So blocking causes blocking. Yes, it causes blocking. However, I don't mean to hack on the, um, the question, because it's a great question. So what is actually happening here? Why, why did the server stall like that? Some people might argue that um, blocking the event loop is the new you broke the build, which is pretty much what is happening here. So here's a nice diagram explaining what's actually happening and why the server grinded to a halt. Because on the left-hand side, we have a default dispatcher. And you see we're using the default dispatcher from the actor system at the, at the top there. So it means that future, that sleeping, will be happening on the default dispatcher. So all the bluish color is the sleeping. And where does the app actually do something? I'll help you out. Over there, this, this one green tiny little bar, that's the application actually running. So we want to avoid that. So how do we avoid that, though? Actually, in Akka, it's really simple, because we basically just need to configure a separate dispatcher. And on that dispatcher, we'll use um, a thread pool executor, right? So by thread pool executor, we can precisely say how, ma how many, at a maximum, threads should be there. And the dispatcher should never grow beyond that, right? Because the default one in Akka is a fork join pool. And what does the fork join pool do? It always keeps increasing the number of threads because it tries to avoid starving everyone. But at some point, it doesn't help anymore if you have you know, four CPUs, like virtual, uh, but 5,000 threads, that's, you know, that's not helping. So instead, we want to limit the threads that can be blocked. And this is how we can do it in Codeman. 
instead of using the default dispatcher, we just say system dispatchers look up and pick the, pick the one that we configured uh, right a second ago. And we don't really need to change anything else, right? If you would like to be really explicit, you can pass uh, the um, blocking dispatcher as argument to the future explicitly, right? You know that. And the behavior now is pretty good. So we have uh, isolated all the bad behavior onto the my blocking dispatcher, right? So there is sleeping going on, there's the bad things still happening, but it doesn't impact the rest of the application. So we have this mantra in the ACA community that's uh, never block, right? And it's both helpful and not helpful at the same time because it's a nice mantra that's easy to remember and it's a nice goal to strive for to not block all the time. But it's not really realistic because so many things in our world like surrounding us with real you know, outside interactions and disk access, there will be some blocking. So the mantra shouldn't be really never block, but blocking needs careful management. But that doesn't sound as fancy, so people, people know the never block mantra. But now you know. So another one. Uh, so we have a, a wait API, so which is already good because it's a separate API that you actually need to go and look for if you want to do the wrong thing, which is blocking. Uh, but sometimes people still do it, right? So you can do this cascading awaiting for one thing and I'm gonna wait for another thing. Not really good because we keep blocking a lot here, right? So better, obviously, for comprehension with uh, monadic futures. You guys know that. You just can compose all the and chain all the operations I want to do on the future, and then once the future gets completed, all the operations get applied. So that's already better. However, there is a semantic difference between those two. Because here, I actually have this await at most three seconds. I don't have that here, right? In the monadic transformations, it's, it's not there by default. But I actually usually do want to have some form of timeout, because I'm calling this HTTP thing, and if it doesn't come back to me in a second or so, I probably missed my SLA already, so let's just fail the thing. Uh, so here's how you can do it with uh, a, the least known pattern in ACA, I think. Like everybody is forgetting about it, but it's actually very useful, which is the ACA pattern after. And it basically says, okay, so after three seconds, uh, dear scheduler, please do this piece of code. And you basically return a future there. So here I just want to fail after three seconds. And then I combine this failure future with the future of the result that I wanted to get. Right? So this is how we can back, get back the semantics of timing out. Whew. Still with me? We're halfway through. So, uh, jumping to another topic, and yes, the thing on the right there is a turtle, and its turtle is all the way down, but uh, why should we avoid Java serialization? So there's multiple reasons, and yes, it's actually enabled by default, and I'm really sorry. Um, I would actually, and we, the team, would actually love to disable it by default, and we actually may do that in future versions, but the thing is, it's so easy to get started with, right? And that's both the best thing about it and the worst thing about it, because you start with it, and then you go to prod, and you didn't you know, spend the time to move away from it. And now you're in prod with Java serialization, which is both slow, heavy, and not really secure because it just arbitrarily, every few months or so, there's attacks published about how to attack Java serialization. So, but let's talk about the speed. So, let's say you're benchmarking, and we get that a lot on the mailing list. So someone is benchmarking the ping pong case, so two actors are ping ponging the message between them. and. Uh, in, in process, that gets pretty fast. We do like five million per second or something like that. And once you hit the network though, so it goes between uh, two JVMs, um, there is serialization involved, right? So that already adds some overhead. And the problem is that with Java serialization, the overhead is more like that, so <laughs> very far away. So the ball takes a longer time to go through the network. So uh, since ACA 2.4, we actually started logging a warning that, hey, please fix that, right? So at least now you know. Uh, but how bad is it really? And I don't mean to hack on it, but I do want to give some uh, numbers to give a um, uh, brief um, look at it. So here's a benchmark. Uh, you can test it in the ACA uh, code base. It's there. 
And this is the result. So this is on a local uh, setting. So basically just enabling serialization without even crossing network boundaries. And as you can see here, it's basically uh, 25 micros with Java serialization and one without, right? So serialization is really heavy. So what can we do better? Because I keep yammering, oh my god, you're doing the wrong thing. But I thought, how about I explain how to do the right thing? Because it's not that hard, actually. So of course, there's many, many different trade-offs when picking the serialization format. For example, uh, proto buffers, uh, Google protocol buffers, or Thrift, or JSON even, are well, easier to evolve in a compatible way. And they all have different trade-offs, right? With protobuf, you have some boilerplate. Uh, you have to maintain the IDL files, etc. But it gives you the easiest way to evolve your protocol if you care about that. So internally, because we do care, we use uh, protocol buffers a lot. But on the other side of the spectrum, there's cryo, which is really easy to set up. Uh, you've got a few seconds to read the entire code that is needed to set up a cryo serializer. So it's not that much, right? And the performance gain compared to um, Java is already 5x, right? It's not that much code, and you got a 5x improvement. So consider it if you're still on Java serialization. Uh, random factoids about uh, why is it so slow? For, m for many reasons. Well, first one is it never was designed as a fast thing. It was just, OK, we have this object. Let's serialize it. And no one really cared back then about the performance of it. So it's a bit heavy. It's a bit on the verbose side. Uh, these are examples from James Sutherland's blog, uh, but I wanted to use them because they're really, really wonderful. Even XML is smaller. <laughs> OK? <laughs> that, that says a lot, right? So JSON, yeah, we can squeeze a little bit more, but we do keep uh, all the names there. We did lose all the types, right? So in the Java one, you see there's the actual types there in the, in the serialized format. And in Cryo, of course, that's a binary format, so all the dashes are just mm, uh, binary gibberish. But you can see there, we actually keep around uh, what types it was. Interesting to know. So uh, please don't use it. And of course, there's also different trade-offs. So in uh, just remoting, in remote messages, probably you can get away with Cryo, because um, if you roll out a new app, you do a green-blue deployment, they probably will not end up talking to differently versioned uh, protocols. However, in long-time persistence uh, systems, for example, you know, ACA persistence, you're persisting events, and you better be using something that's really goodly evolvable over years. Because the event stored there, you want to read the event two years from now, three years from now, right? So there's different trade-offs. So uh, bear in mind, it's not the question of what should I use for ACA serialization in general? You also have to think about the context. Am I persisting the messages? Am I just sending them around? And think about it this way. And the usual disclaimer, trust no one, including myself. And there was a benchmark, so um, don't trust the benchmark. Do the benchmark yourself if you actually want to trust any numbers. And there's great tools, including uh, my SBT plugin, if you want to benchmark some uh, uh, Scala code. There's the uh, SBT JMH plugin, and JMH is a benchmarking tool basically developed by the OpenJDK team for their internal needs of benchmarking the collections and everything else. So let it crash. So we have this thing that's called an error, and we have a failure. And actually, we take it as very different things. And I'm not going to uh, go in and start rambling about the reactive manifesto, which I do think is great. But I do want to explain what the actual difference is, because it's something that the manifesto coined. But sometimes people get stuck on explaining the diagram. You all know the diagram, right? But there's actually way more interesting things in there. So we have such a thing that is called uh, supervision in ACA, right? So what is it really about? So let's say I have a, a vending machine, I insert some cash, and then, OK, it wasn't enough cash, so I get an error back, right? Note, this is an error, and this is like a user land actual message that has a nice description that, hey, please give me more money, something like that. And then there's the second case, which is actual failures. 
right? So let's say I'm trying to grab the can. I'm, I'm in the middle of the machine, an actor trying to operate this can grabbing mechanism, and it blows up. So that's very different from the case of, OK, you didn't give me enough cash for this drink. Because for this thing, we want to notify whoever is operating the machine, right? So the owner of the machine, maybe some callback, and then they can send some service person to fix the machine. I don't think the person buying the drink cares about technical details of that failure. They just will want to know, OK, I'm not getting my drink, right? So errors versus failures. And failures in ACA are always propagated upwards to parents. And we have it very explicitly in ACA, right? That's the supervision tree. And errors, that's just a message, something we design in. OK. So supervision, we talked about it. But we also have back of supervision, which is one of those hidden gems that maybe you haven't noticed until now. So back of supervision is basically giving more breathing space to systems that need it. An example being, um, I have this persistent actor, and there's some kind of database, and it actually blows up because of some reason. And what we could have been doing, we don't. Okay, so this is not what ACA does, but it could. If we did the naive way, is okay, I try to store something into the database, I get the failure, supervision kicks in, actor restarts because that's what supervision is for. So I try to persist, I blow up, I restart, I try to persist, I blow up, I restart. You, you get the idea. So the problem is, well, it's not like one actor got the failure if the database is down. Most likely there's tens of thousands of them, and suddenly everybody is hammering the database. That's not going to help it recover. So this is what actually happens in ACA persistence. When we have uh, such a case that persistence, for some reason, can't uh, store your events, OK, it blows up. We get recovery failures, for example, or persist failures. But they stop. OK? The default here is stopping the actors, which is um, a bit different than, uh, than the default in normal supervision, right? Uh, so this is a specific example from cluster sharding. So, but we do want to recover those guys, right? But we don't want to recover them right away and do this, do this rush on the servers. But we want someone externally, so here it's a back of supervisor, and this is a class provided by Akka, which you configure um, what is the breathing kind of time uh, you want to give the system before you start recovering. So it's basically like recovery, but with a circuit breaker. And this external guy will. Uh, take care of restarting these actors in increasing amounts of time to give the database more breathing space to, to recover. Uh, so it's, I kept saying database, but it actually is um, about any kind of failure that you may be trashing someone and you want to give them some breathing space. It could be that you've just w reached your quota and some API starts failing to you because you've just exceeded your quota. You can do the same thing there. Okay. So, um, state machines. This is something, um, so I didn't do the example of uh, 20 or 50 uh, receive cases, but we sometimes see that at, at, at customers or at uh, just open source people posting their snippets. And basically when you see like 50 cases or you know maybe 10, it depends on your case, it's basically this, right? You do remember that from the JavaScript pyramid of hell. It's just that in actors, you don't get the pyramid because it's flat, right? It's a, it's a flatter mid. Um, but it's the same problem. Too much stuff going on in the same place. Uh, so it looks OK because, yeah, everything is flat and we only have one receive method. So it loops back into the same thing. So we don't get a pyramid of doom. But what you actually very likely have in such a meth receive method then is uh, multiple states. And I'm ready to bet for, you know, maybe a drink. But usually when you have too many things going on in a receive method, you likely have multiple states hidden in there. And if you extract them, for example, there's a make things with some metadata. I'm in this mode of making things. And then I want to become, uh, if someone tells me uh, to do other things, like a third case on uh, the make things receive method, then I become, OK, awaiting instructions. And now it's suddenly more reasonable to, to understand what the hell is going on here. 
Uh, we also have this FSM trait, which basically is a helper trait, which um, helps you do exactly the same thing which I modeled here with just uh, context become. So become just swaps the receive method for a new, mod, a new one. Whereas uh, finite state machines uh, give you this um, API that allows you to, okay, so when I'm in the idle state, this is what I'll be doing. And it also encourages a passing around the data, right? So you get an event. So the first thing there is a message, and the second thing is the data, right? So instead of having variables in the actor, you can just pass around in a more functional way the state. Good. Okay, this is the last topic and uh, most mind-blowing, perhaps. So we'll see. We have this thing uh, called the ACA cluster, right? You've seen it, maybe used it. Who has actually used the ACA cluster? Half of the people, maybe. Okay. So we have this thing called cluster convergence. So out of the people who have used uh, the ACA cluster, who knows what convergence is? Not that many. Still, still a few, so good job, guys. Uh, the problem is that many people skip over that section of the documentation, and it's actually a really important one because it talks about the actual guarantees what the cluster does. So convergence by itself is defined that, okay, we can prove that the cluster state that we're observing is, has been observed by everybody else in the cluster. So everybody has a consistent view on the membership, okay? And uh, actions as joining and leaving the cluster need to be made when there is convergence, right? So everybody makes the same decision if this node is joining or not, right? Because we want to be consistent. I don't want a cluster that some part of the cluster thinks the node is already part of it, and some other part of the cluster doesn't think the node is part of the cluster, right? That would be bad. So these things require convergence. Uh, here's a mini diagram from the docs which uh, explains all the transitions between the states. If this is too small, then I'll um, just quickly, from the top left, it's joining up, leaving, exiting, and then, then removed, right? So it's a very simple life cycle. And then today we're gonna talk about a feature that you may have not seen, but it's actually very interesting if you're in the scenario of, okay, we're under heavy load, maybe there's even cluster petitions, but we still need to grow the cluster because we need to survive the load. So this is something you need to enable explicitly. Uh, it's called the allow weekly up members, and there's gonna be an example. But first, let's talk about a cluster party. So let's try to see how the joining to a cluster, to a party, uh, looks like. So we have two seed nodes. So seed nodes are basically just, I know where the party is, so I want to join it. And I know the address of a node, for example, right? And here, the seed one, so the guy with the funny hat, not just the normal hat, is uh, the leader, okay? So that's also something people are sometimes confused about. Okay, so is Akka cluster uh, leaderless? You have a leader. So the thing is, the leader is uh, not something special, right? The, the leader is basically the oldest node that is um, in the cluster, and the only reason we need to have a single node be kind of a special thing is we need to have a single point where decisions are made. But if a, if a seed node one goes down, then we just declare, okay, so the second oldest now is the leader. So it's um, there is a leader role, but it's not like doing a lot of stuff. Okay, so joining works like that. So a new node comes in called Kurt, and then the existing cluster gets um, gossiped around, and everybody eventually knows that, okay, Kurt is joining. There's a small K at the foot of, uh, at the feet of uh, seed node there. And then the leader sees, okay, so everybody in the cluster has seen Kurt, so I can move him to up. And by up we mean, okay, now it is actually part of the cluster. Good, now he's with us. Now about unreachability. So in terms of our cluster, we talk about unreachability, which means uh, we do a periodic heart beating, and if a node doesn't re respond to the heartbeat, we declare it unreachable. But unreachable is not down, right? Down is a very specific thing. So uh, here's the thing I explained about weekly up, because to, to declare someone up, normally you would need to have cluster convergence. So everybody knows that the 
new state of a cluster will be with a new node. However, if one node is unreachable, we can't say everybody knows because we can't tell this other guy. So this is where weekly up uh, kicks in. And if you have this scenario, you are allowed to basically join, but in this special state, in a weekly up state. So yes, it is actually part of a cluster now and can do everything um, a normal node in the cluster would do. And once the unreachable node comes back, we inform it about, okay, here's this new person. And then it is declared properly up. Um, so this is something you need to think about. Do I need to be really, really consistent with the cluster membership? Or can I cut corners because we really need to scale out? Okay, so now the opposite case. Let's say Bill has a birthday party and Bill declares, I'm going home. What I mean here is um, cluster leave self, right? I, I call that, uh, but then vanishes immediately, right? So what I mean in that sense is cluster leave self, system exit. Okay, the problem is that cluster leaving is a graceful process, so you need to tell everybody that you're leaving, right? Understandably so. Uh, but if you kind of shut down the JVM right after starting to tell everybody that you're leaving, then they probably didn't even get their message. So instead of having a graceful leaving, you suddenly are in this uh, situation of, hey, where's Bill? Where's the Bill node? And failure detection kicks in. They declare him unreachable. And Basically, you can go into unreachable from any kind of state, right? Because it's the heartbeating transition. If you don't reply to heartbeats, you can become unreachable and you can, can come back again. But at some point, if the node is not coming back for minutes or days, usually minutes, uh, you will want to declare it as down, right? So we have a auto downing feature, but it's not really safe because it's a bit racy. Uh, we do have a commercial add-on that's for split brain resolver that does a, a kind of voting uh, if we should down the person or not. Or you can uh, decide on the downing uh, by hooking into an external monitoring system, right? The external monitoring system gives you an alert, okay, the node is really down, and then you call the down in the ACA cluster. By default, we don't eject nodes just on a whim. And now, the problem is, what if a node wasn't really down, it was just GCing for five minutes, right? Everybody thinks it was down because, oh, yeah, five minutes not replying to heartbeat must have been down. You declare it down, and the thing that happens then when it comes back is we basically say that you're already dead. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you anymore because, well, you've been away for a very long time. You probably calculated something on stale data, and I don't want to talk with you anymore. You're a zombie. Sorry. Right? So this is uh, specifically about, in the ACA cluster, in ACA persistence specifically, we try to maintain what we call the single writer principle, right? And this is, um, we, we really try to err on the consistent side of things by default, right? So if I declared someone down, I basically do not want to trust any of the things he's doing. I also will assume that if I downed him, then I take over all of his responsibilities and even if he comes back and wants to still do his responsibilities, we've moved on already, right? Um, so that's on that side of things. However, there's the other side of things, which is ACA distributed data, which is just CRDTs, uh, which uh, is on the opposite spectrum, right? There's a partition, the partition heals, everybody converges, and there's no conflicts, there's no single writer, everybody writes all the time. So again, uh, you need to pick the tool appropriate to a use case. Right. Okay, and a small reminder, people sometimes get confused. Uh, quarantine, you may have seen it in the logs maybe sometimes. So quarantine is a, um, a state of underlying remoting transport, right? So the cluster doesn't really deal about, deal about quarantine, right? We, also, we only talked about unreachable and down. Okay. Pretty much one of the last things I have to say today is that ACA is a toolkit. I keep stressing that and I try to explain it as many times as I can. And basically, we try to be a small library of things that you can pick and choose from. However, 
sometimes people would ask, we now have ACA HTTP, right? And does ACA HTTP compete with Play? No, it doesn't completely because we're a very, very low level thing which doesn't help you with anything which Play helps you with, like maintaining uh, the database connection pools, compiling your JavaScripts, et cetera, et cetera, doing the reloading of the pages. That's all Play things, right? We, we never want to do those things on a, uh, so Play is focused on develop productivity which usually means more stuff. We're on the, the less stuff, the better. Which is, um, Runa did this awesome talk and it's being quoted a lot on Scala conferences. Uh, Martin quoted it as well in the beginning of the conference here. So constraints liberate and liberties constrain, which is that you should be picking the least powerful abstraction, right? Kind of funny to hear it from Akka guy because Akka actors are basically far there, they can do anything, right? However, uh, sometimes that's exactly what you need, right? So here's power, here's constraints. So futures, okay, sometimes fun, but they're limited to a single value inside there, right? If I want to have multiple values and compute like things um, average or compute zip, um, compute something on a stream of data, then you have ACA streams. And ACA streams are more limiting than ACA actors. Uh, not only because they are local abstraction, but also because the layout is static, kind of, right? You explain to Akka streams what the flow of the data will be, and you run it. Whereas in actors, they can be completely dynamically moving and starting and stopping and talking to whoever wants, whoever they want, right? However, what Akka actors do um, greatly is distribution, right? Because of the messaging at the core of it, you can very easily go into a distributed setting and back and forth because the model, the programming model remains the same. Um, oh yeah, this is basically what I've been saying here. Akka typed, yes, it's uh, still experimental, uh, but if you have time, try it out. We're still happy to receive feedback and we'll see how we can take it further. Okay, so like I said, we try to be a toolkit and yeah, last but not least, really the community, right? It's a big part of what ACA is and the Scala community as a whole. So how to reach us? Uh, yes, there's the website. The website is uh, kind of outdated, but the most up-to-date and most interesting thing for you guys is the issues and specifically the community contrib or how we call them now, um, easy to contribute and also low priority tickets. If for something marked low priority, we basically mean the core team doesn't have time for it. But if you would step up and be able to submit a PR, we'd be super happy to, to pull it in. And you can talk to us on the Gitter channel. So Akka Akka is about using Akka. Like, how do I do this with Akka? And Akka Dev is if you're trying to work on a pull request or actually some internal thingies. And also in the next uh, week or two, we're gonna launch a mini campaign uh, that's basically going to try to encourage people to contribute a bit, and there's going to be some cool t-shirts to win. So if you're into Akka t-shirts, I certainly am, then uh, look out for the Akka and uh, Lightband blogs in the next weeks. Uh, here's a few links. Uh, here's one of the quotes from the Tower of Programming, which I uh, live and die by. <laughs> and this is all I got, so thank you. We do have a short while for questions. A few minutes. Very in the back, please. Can you explain better why uh, actor selection is bad? Right. Um, so the question was, why is actor selection bad? And if I expl can explain it more deeply. So um, as a concept, maybe it doesn't seem as hurtful as it really is. But the thing is, it's one of those things that can be easily abused. So what I found in, in some consulting engagements was that instead of, um, instead, you know, you have some, um, some interaction going on, like an image actor and some backend actor, etc. And instead of them knowing about each other, just by either being passed in, in the constructor or as a message, they would uh, just synthesize the path by guessing and remembering where the other guy lives. And that's very brittle, 
right? Because it's not encoded in code that, okay, this actor f passing it over here, now I have it, but it's this making up the address, and yes, currently it works, but it may not. And the thing is, uh, by sending to an actor selection, um, because there's two ways you can use it. You can just send messages to an actor selection, or you can use an actor selection to get an actor ref back. So the second one is already better, because okay, then I have an actor ref, but if you just send messages to an actor selection, then you probably won't even notice that you're sending to, to a black hole. Well, you will notice in dead letters, but you know, it's not very uh, visible just by looking at the code. Okay, do we have another question? Yeah, yes, please. Uh, is there a bridge under development between the type data system and the regular system? Uh, well, bridge. Um, the thing is, Akka typed is built exactly as a, I don't know, 200 lines of code on top of normal actors. So by, by bridge, you basically mean um, which way around? So the two systems can talk to each other? Like yeah, they can. It's the same system. Uh, so as I'm saying, it's basically just a API on top of the current actors. So it's exactly the same protocol, it's the same system, so they can communicate to each other. Obviously, if you start talking to an untyped one, then yeah, then it's untyped. Okay, last question maybe, here in the middle. Oh. Yeah, uh, excellent question. So, uh, is back pressure only available in streams? Uh, yes and no. Um, so back pressure in the nice way of I don't actually have to care and think about it at all. Yes, that's only in streams, but that's um, because the infrastructure there basically handles it transparently and you just save a map. And what enables us to do it there uh, transparently is actually the strict layout of the, di of the processing pipeline. So again, if it's more restrictive, we can do more stuff internally uh, optimize and do the back pressure thing, for example. But what it actually is, it's basically very similar to work pooling. So on the internals, what uh, the back pressure protocol looks like is you send someone, I am ready to receive 10 elements, and then someone can send you 10 elements. So technically, you can implement the same thing in actors, but the actor signatures there's no way to express this statically and nicely because you can always send a message to someone. And it would be really hard to, to make it, well, we could fail with an exception, but that's not helping, right? Um, so you can do it yourself, but it's not uh, built in, in that sense. If you're looking for it, then the work pooling pattern is um, pretty much the way people do it with actors. Okay, so thank you very much. If you have any questions, just grab me.